Able's in on air is sponsored by Green Mountain Support Services, empowering people with disabilities to be home in the community. Washington County Mental Health, where hope and support comes together. Media sponsors for Ableton On Air include Parkchester Times, Muslim Community Report, www.thisisthebronx.info, Associated Press Media Editors, New York Parrot Online Newspaper, U.S. Press Corps, Domestic and International, Anchor FM, and Spotify. Partners for Ableton On Air include Yachad, New York and New England, where everyone belongs. The Orthodox Union. The Vermont Division for the Blind and Visually Impaired. The Vermont Association for the Blind and Visually Impaired. The Montpelier Sustainable Coalition. Central Vermont, Habitat for Humanity. Abel Air has been seen in the following publications. Parkchester Times. New York Parrot Online Newspaper. Muslim Community Report, www.thisisthebronx.info, and www.h.com. Ableton On Air is a member of the National Academy for Television Arts and Sciences, Boston, New England chapter. Welcome to this edition of Ableton On Air, the one and only program that focuses on the needs, concerns, and achievements of the differently able. Before we get to our program today, we would like to say special thanks to our sponsors, Green Mountain Support Services, Washington County Mental Health, and many others, including the support of um, the Association for the Blind and Visually Impaired of Vermont, the Division for the Blind and Visually Impaired of Vermont, Central Vermont Habitat for Humanity, and many others, and also uh, on today's uh, television program, the support of um, the Rose F. Kennedy Center of the Bronx and um, the Albert Einstein College of Medicine and Montefiore Medical Center. Uh, with us to discuss this important topic of uh, the Rose F. Kennedy Center and their work and the work of the Kennedys in the lens of uh, the Kennedy family, we would like to welcome, uh, <clears throat> we would like to welcome uh, Joanne Siegel, co-director of the Rose F. Kennedy Center, part of the Albert Einstein College of Medicine, and she's a licensed social worker in the field of special needs. Welcome, Joanne. Thank you, I, I'm so pleased to be here today. Okay, uh, tell me the missions and goals of, uh, tell us the missions and goals of the Rose F. Kennedy Center and uh, its work in, the, in Bronx, New York. Sure, the Rose F. Kennedy Center for individuals with developmental disabilities was basically established in 1966 with the groundbreaking at on the grounds of Jacoby Medical Center mm -hmm. and part and it was part of the Albert Einstein College of Medicine and today it remains the leader in our um, our work in developmental disabilities the uh, the purpose of the Kennedy Center was actually part of the 1966 um, legislation that was signed by um, John F. Kennedy. It was the Developmental Disabilities Services and Facilities Construction Act. With that legislation, monies were set aside for university settings to provide science research, mm -hmm. community education, and clinical services for people with at that time, the, the language was mental retardation. We now use the terminology intellectual disabilities. And we also include developmental disabilities, which is a little broader um, spectrum of people having certain conditions that uh, appear before the age of 22. Why was, so with that, I'm sorry, my, my question, I'm sorry for interrupting. Why, why was the language different back then versus now? Why was the language, um, you, you said mental retardation, why was the language different back then versus what it is now? Okay, so uh, essentially um, many of, uh, language evolves, okay? Language is never stagnant. Mm -hmm. And the words mental retardation were actually clinical terms mm -hmm. that were part of um, the diagnostic 
manual for medical conditions. Um, over the years, through advocacy, the terminology has changed and mainly because of the negative connotation or the negative connections that people have when they use the term mental retardation, it had become over the years a derogatory term. Yeah. And so people that, that are self-advocates actually spoke up and asked for that terminology to be changed. And so the terminology that we now use today is intellectual disabilities. Not developmental disabilities, it's intellectual, correct? Right, intellectual ha relates to those individuals who before the age of 22 have um, a cognitive um, involvement in terms of a learning difficulty. Um, they also have what's what are called functional uh, issues or difficulties. That means um, anything related to um, walking, talking, um, and self-care, mm -hmm. any of those combinations. So it has to be a combination of, of a cognitive deficit mm -hmm. as well as functional uh, deficits. Mm -hmm. Developmental disabilities is related to a broader spectrum of conditions in which a person doesn't necessarily have a cognitive involvement, but they may have they may have a physical impairment mm. that basically um, interferes with um, with their functioning. So an example would be cerebral palsy. So a person with cerebral palsy might have difficulty with walking um, and may use a wheelchair, um, may or may not. But it, it basically it is it it's, it it's an impairment that that. Um, interferes with some type of life activity, but does not include a um, necessarily a cognitive uh, issue mm. or learning. Um, before we get to the, to the real work of the Kennedy Center, um, tell me a little bit or tell us a little bit about uh, Rosemary Kennedy and um, the whole reason behind uh, the act uh, that Kennedy signed. Okay. Um, the Kennedy family is quite interesting. Um, Rosemary Kennedy was the third child born to Rose F. Kennedy mm -hmm. and, um, and John uh, Kennedy. And so basically there was a, a, an elder son, Joseph, who actually died um, at the age of 29 uh, in World War II. And the second son was John F. Kennedy and then there was Rosemary. She was the actually the first female uh, within the Kennedy family. Mm -hmm. And um, Rosemary at birth had some um, had a, a problem. Uh, the, her mom, Rose Rose Kennedy, had some difficulties during labor, and um, as a result, from what people surmise, there were some problems that Rosemary had with. Um, with having lack of, of oxygen during the delivery. And so she did have some mild cognitive or, or learning problems, okay? Um, and so that was some condition that she experienced throughout her life. Mm -hmm. um, the Kennedy family was a very wealthy family, a very well-connected family. And the father in that family had ambitions for their, in particular for his sons, to move ahead in terms of politics. And um, Rosemary, unfortunately, at the time, and this, is, this gets into the issue of stigma and how people um, at that period of time mm -hmm. um, felt toward individuals with disabilities. And so the father... And the mother really kind of kept Rosemary um, not within the public view. And so she was raised um, until her school years. She was she was raised at home. But when when she entered school, she entered a number of specialized schools that were residential. Um, and basically, um, she was not within the family. She was she was sent away to school. Now, what happened when Rosemary entered um, teenage years and early adulthood, um, she actually was a very attractive woman. And her dad was concerned about um, 
her being involved maybe with dating and, and, and social activities. So unbeknownst to the mother, Rose, the Rose was away at the time, um, the, the father um, basically, uh, my understanding, um, contacted a, um, a physician who was, uh, was doing some experimental um, work. It, it, it's, it, and it, was it a, a lobotomy from what I understand? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. And so um, he, <clears throat> I guess is what he wanted to do, they were concerned that she was going to act out and, and, and have behavioral problems, mm -hmm. and in particular um, around sexuality. So he made arrangements for this physician to um, do surgery and a lobotomy was performed. And unfortunately it did not go well and Rosemary, um, the, the end result was that she actually suffered more um, uh, neurological problems and really was left much more um, uh, disabled mm -hmm. as a result of the surgery. Mm -hmm. So from then on, um, Rosemary lived in residential um, facilities mm -hmm. and um, ultimately uh, she spent the rest of her life in, in residential uh, schools mm -hmm. outside of New York State. Mm -hmm. um, and it was only um, uh, from what I had read, only after the father died, then the family was brought her a little bit more home, but she has subsequently passed away. But getting back mm -hmm. to the Rose F. Kennedy Center, the Kennedy Center is named after Rose, uh, the mother, who was a very dedicated woman. And um, she's a woman who understood from a parent perspective what it was to have a child that had a disability. And so she was an advocate for persons with disabilities, including mental health disabilities. So there was um, intellectual disabilities and mental health disabilities. And it was John F. Kennedy, Rosemary's older brother, who took on a much needed supported role for people with, with disabilities. And one of the first acts that he signed as legislation was in 19, um, 1963, this Developmental Disability Service Facilities Act. And what it did was allow funding for centers where you would have research, education, and clinical services mm -hmm. for people with uh, IDD, mm -hmm. okay? And, the, and that was, we were one of the first centers that were given funding and we received actually additional funding through the Kennedy Foundation for our building. Mm -hmm. And uh, Rose Kennedy was, was there with, um, when the groundbreaking occurred in 1966, mm -hmm. um, Robert Kennedy was there, Eunice Shriver and her husband mm -hmm. were there. Um, and they were very, very pleased to uh, participate in this effort. And, um, and so we have some photographs and um, material from from that day um, in 1966. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so um, the Rose F. Kennedy uh, Center focuses on occupational and physical therapy. Go through some of the services that you guys um, provide the families, okay. uh, along so, with so, along yeah. with advocacy. The floor mm -hmm. is yours. Okay. Go ahead. Okay, so, so essentially um, the, the Rose F. Kennedy Center is made up of three components. And the three components are um, our clinical component, which is the Children's Evaluation and Rehabilitation Center. Mm -hmm. And that center is headed by um, Dr. Lisa Schulman. Yep. She's the interim director right now. And we serve approximately 5,000 children per year with about 40,000 visits. Now, because of COVID, the numbers are a little bit um, Strange, yeah. different, but we're doing a remote as well as in-person <clears throat> uh, yep. So they do a lot of evaluations of very young children in order to develop treatment plans for mm -hmm. the children to ameliorate some of the issues that they're coming with. So we see children with intellectual disabilities, speech and language disabilities, behavioral issues, um, a wide range of issues. Um, and But the center is noted for its work in early identification of autism. Mm -hmm. um, we also provide special needs dentistry 
we provide speech and language services and treatment, mm -hmm. occupational therapy, physical therapy, mm -hmm. um, audio, audiological services, um, and mental health services. Um, that is our clinical program. Out of that clinical program, we then provide another um, set of services, and that begins our training. We have our so lens. you train. So I'm sorry to interrupt. You, uh, you train the medical school as well, because you said that you help the medical school out. Yes. Um, so we have we have a large training program. It's our lens program. That program is dedicated to to undergraduate disciplines. We have 16 disciplines that we train students in, mm -hmm. and it is called our Leadership in Education and Neurodevelopmental Disabilities. And our students come and they get a stipend for participating in the program for a year training course. Mm -hmm. We also, separate from, from LENS, but with our medical school, we have begun to do some embedding of um, intellectual and developmental disabilities into the curriculum of the medical school um, at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine. Um, and um, so, that, yeah. Uh, when you train or when students are trained, um, <clears throat> do they obviously they go through a, 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 a variety of trainings. Is one of the trainings that they go through uh, sensitivity training? You know, because a lot of people, uh, do you think when people go into working with people with disabilities, do you think that they are scared to work with uh, the population? Or how, how, yeah. how, how do you... How do, you, how do you go about um, working with the medical school with issues like this? Okay, so when we do our training with students in particular, we're trying to break down barriers in, in, in care, first mm -hmm. of all. Yep. Um, our um, LEND students um, attends um, sessions on um, bias, bias training, you know, um, and, and also within our program, we incorporate self advocates and parents as training the trainees. So it's a mixture of undergraduate students, and then people that come with life experience. So we have um, parents, as I mentioned, and we have self advocates that are part of the program, and they're incorporated right into the program, they meet weekly with our students. And there is an exchange of, um, of ideas and issues that occurs during these sessions. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of like hands-on first-person experience uh, for the students. What do you think some um, of the biases, uh, sorry, uh, what do you think some of the biases have been both in past, you know, because, you know, we mentioned the word retardation, we mentioned uh, certain words because in the past for example 1800s you had people with disabilities in institutions so how has bias has been uh, broken down past present and future or going into the future so I think unfortunately part of human nature is is um, that we have to begin to learn to understand people I always start off with stigma. Mm -hmm. um, people who have an intellectual disability are, um, are, are at a great disadvantage because of stereotype ideas. The idea is that, that a person with an intellectual disability has no capability to do anything or to make decisions for themselves. And so that kind of stereotype needs to be broken down. Um, ancient cultures, um, viewed people with disabilities in many different ways. Um, but part of that was related to the fact that um, we had in ancient times, Greek and Roman cultures, you had infanticide where if a child had a clear uh, disability or deformity, they would let the child um, basically um, put them on a mountaintop and, and let nature take its course and the person would die. Yeah. Um, but that, that You was, said the person would was, die? You child said? would be left on the mountaintop. Yeah, wow. that was in fantasy. Yeah. Um, but as cultures began to develop and a better understanding of, 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 
you know, disabilities. There were different groups that rose up in the Middle Ages. There were, um, there were religious groups that founded asylums or places where a person would be sent so that they could be taken care of. So it was a little bit more humanistic. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and basically, um, but th there was always poverty so that this group of people were always treated, you know, um, uh, without with not being treated well, okay? Um, and then during the Industrial Revolution, we had people who basically had disabilities and they could work actually on a farm. But when yeah. the Industrial Revolution came, they could not transition to an industrial lifestyle. So many people were left behind and they were left on farms. And those farms essentially became the beginning of institutional care mm. in the United States. Yeah. With uh, um, yeah. Why, let me ask you, um, since we're talking about institutional care, um, Robert F. Kennedy um, in, in the 1960s viewed Willowbrook State School as a snake, uh, snake pit, okay? And according to um, Geraldo Rivera, his quote, <clears throat> in front of the cameras, um, um, it smelled like filth, it smelled like disease, and it smelled of death. Why, uh, why were institutions, now, mind you, it was a good idea at the time, but why, were, why did institutions get so bad and then parents had to, parents and other people from organizations had to pull people out? Why did it get so bad, and why do people? Why did people's mindsets get in that way, as far as people with disabilities having to be put away? If you get my okay, point, okay. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. So as I said, um, people that were left behind were left behind in more rural areas. So that's mm. where institutions basically began to spring up. Mm. Um, numbers of people. So you have you have people moving into the cities, the type of lifestyle changing, mm. okay? Yep. Um, people left behind, larger numbers of people left behind then, and they needed to be taken care of. So these small farm settings turned into small institutions and then larger institutions as families um, could, no, could no longer take care of the person due to, you know, industrial issues or, and... Um, and what also happened was, at the same time, breakthroughs in medicine, okay? Mm -hmm. So people were beginning with the, with the breakthrough of antibiotics and um, medical advances. People with disabilities were living, beginning to live longer. So the numbers of people grew at that same time. Now, what happened um, after World War II, so there was um, a feeling that um, basically in the United States, there was a good feeling that we had, you know, um, we had liberated Europe, um, mm -hmm. and we as a nation were young, had a lot of energy and families when, when they, when men returned home, families did not want to accept, begin to accept the idea of an institution. So it were at that time after world war II, and in the 1950s, families were saying, we went abroad, we fought for freedom, we want better care for our sons and daughters. And so movements like the, the ARCs, okay, mm -hmm. um, the began- Ar The ARCs, the, the, the Association for the Help of Retarded Children? Children, yes. So those were family-based organizations, and they began to advocate for more services for their children, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. So we move into then, that was the 1950s, we move into the 1960s and you have this family, this Kennedy family, who can identify with that, who that becomes a, a priority, mental health as well as IDD, okay? So these social issues become more of a priority. So federal funding begins to open up a little bit for this area. And 
Also at the same time in the 1960s, you have the civil rights movement beginning. And you have, after the civil rights movement, you have women's rights movement. And so um, the next wave of rights begins with people with disabilities. So you have the disabilities community pushing for change and for equal treatment. And so what happens is with that emphasis, you then have the beginning of legislation to back the advocacy efforts of families and individuals with disabilities. So you have in 1965, a major breakthrough with covering health care for people. And that was through President Lyndon Baines Johnson, yep. who passes the Medi Medicare bill, okay? Mm -hmm. And expands a little bit Medicaid, but Medicare becomes a health coverage for, and Medicaid become health coverage for people who are poor mm -hmm. and people who are disabled, okay? Mm -hmm. And we have in the 70s then laws like Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act mm -hmm. in 1973 and begins to prohibit discrimination based on disability mm -hmm. and requires then through 1975, the IDEA, that children have access to public education if they have a disability. So this really opens up then education for, for people with disabilities in 1975. And, and, and so it says children with disabilities are entitled to a free and appropriate public education. So now the public schools have to open their doors to everyone and not refuse people, yeah. okay? Yeah. Um, in the 1980s, again, we see continued community program expansion with group homes, supported apartments, day programs, Medicaid expansion. And that's when also because of Willowbrook and places like Willowbrook across the country. Yeah, uh, that's what village to be specific also. Yeah. Yeah, they um, begin to be mandated to be closed. They were given an opportunity. Willowbrook was given an opportunity to correct itself, but it couldn't. So then the judge in the Willowbrook case said, you must close. And then that opens up again, another funding stream for people to get services in the community. Um, the, the, the 1990s, we see a major, another major piece of legislation, the passage of the ADA Act, mm -hmm. uh, and it prohibits discrimination against people with disabilities in employment, transportation, public accommodations, communications, and access to state and local government programs and services. And so this really puts the onus on, on states to make sure that they begin to change their laws and accommodate people with disabilities. And ultimately um, in 1999, the Olmstead decision um, said that you could not segregate people with disabilities. Um, and then it, that was a form of unlawful discrimination under ADA and you must provide the most integrated setting or environment for a person with a disability. So it, it wasn't no separate but equal. They had to be integrated, okay? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that was the importance of that legislation. So um, that gives a little bit of a, of a summary or a nutshell of the history of how this all worked. Um, but getting back to how is the Kennedy Center set up, I mentioned the clinical program. The LENS program is the training arm. And then we have a research component called um, the IDDRC. So Individuals with Developmental Disabilities Research Center. And that is a center that focuses on research um, on the basic um, causes of intellectual disabilities. And they're working on autism. And they're doing a lot of, um, now because of the advancement of science, you know, they're looking at genetic factors and, and um, many different basic science um, reasons for 
um, disabilities. Um, the USID, which I'm the co-director with Dr. Karen Bonick, um, the, the USID is the University Center for Excellence in Developmental Disabilities. And um, we are funded through, federally funded through ACL, the Administration on Community Living. Yep. And our tasks are to provide, um, to work with these other parts of our program to provide research, service, and most importantly, community education and, and advocacy work. And that is where we come in, in terms of working with the community and trying to, to en enhance the capacity of our community to serve and work with people with disabilities. Yep. Okay. Oh, wow. Um, that's a whole lot of information. Um, <clears throat> since we only have a little bit of time left, um, what, uh, so you've been with the Kennedy Center since 1977. Yes. Did you start out, um, how did you start out working with the Kennedy Center as a parent advocate? Uh, actually, <clears throat> Actually, I, I wore two hats at the time. One, I was um, a clinical social worker, so I worked clinically with families. Mm -hmm. And I worked with adolescents, primarily mm -hmm. um, teenagers. Mm -hmm. And um, But my other hat was community education. And so I worked with volunteers that signed up to, to um, volunteer some hours at, the, at our center. Um, but as time went on, I did more clinical work and my time was divided in half working and doing community education programs. So we did a lot of educational workshops to help parents um, better understand some of the issues related to developmental disabilities. Mm -hmm. We did, we do a lot of advocacy work, meeting with legislators so that they can hear what parents have to say um, as far as what their children need. And over the years, I have worked, actually, since I began at the Kennedy Center, I brought over the first self-advocacy group in New York State called the Bronx Community Self-Advocacy Group. It's a small group, mm -hmm. um, but we, we do a lot of work with um, our state organization, SANUS. Yeah. And the self-advocates run the group. And it's like a peer mentoring type of program. And um, it's very important now, especially because the members um, actually make presentations. As I said, they talk with legislators. Um, they educate, our, they work with our now medical school program, which our second year students hear from them in their medical education, hear their stories and learn from the self-advocates what their needs are because in in medical treatment um there has been a lot of concern that um from from individuals with disabilities that um there are there are um there needs to be a better understanding of how to talk to a person with a disability what their needs are mm -hmm. and and so this is something that we have incorporated into the second year of education with medical school students. So we give them a background on developmental disabilities. We give the students um, an understanding of the difficulties of communication and what they need to spend more time with people with disabilities because it may take longer to do an exam. Um, and you need to listen to the person first and then ask if the caretaker or parent, if there was a parent involved, because we're working with adults, so sometimes there are no parents, mm -hmm. um, then maybe discuss um, or have that person included if the person allows. So we're working on, on really how to um, work with a, 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 developmental, a, a developmentally disabled individual and um, as a physician, how you can help that person overcome barriers. Don't forget, we have physical barriers in the medical office. We have communication barriers. We have um, lots of problems, just even physically getting into offices. Um, there are transportation problems. There's um, 
architectural problems. The buildings aren't accessible. So the rooms aren't accessible. So we're working on all of this so that medical students who will be future leaders in medicine understand the population and can better meet the person where they are, mm -hmm. meet the person where his or her needs are. Mm -hmm. So it's very important because there has been tremendous disparities in health care. Um, disparities in terms of how, how, what, what type of disparities in health care? So what they are are difficulties or delays in obtaining adequate health care because a person may put off seeing a physician because they can't, they can't get to the physician, particularly people that live in rural areas. The lack of physicians are, it's a big problem. Uh, people with physical disabilities may have had problems getting a mammogram. Women have problems, uh, you know, with the pap smear. Um, all these gynecological problems are, are really, really um, now, get, now getting, getting uh, we have a couple of minutes left, getting to your COVID education that you, <laughs> you guys have done. Has, um, what are some of the problems that COVID has um, been with uh, people with disabilities or groups with disabilities? And how has the Kennedy Center worked to try to, um, I mean, uh, you can't fix the entire problem. But how has the Kennedy Center worked to uh, combat that or help people during COVID? I'm glad you asked that question. Um, the Kennedy Center and our USID program have been very, very active with COVID uh, education. So we received um, a small grant from the New York State Developmental Disabilities Planning Council to do COVID education. So we call that project VAX, FAX, DDNY, okay, Developmental Disabilities New York. And that project um, has been um, ongoing now for about 10 months. New York was very hard hit with COVID in the beginning. We were the first really epicenter in the United States. And so we lost a lot of people, particularly those people living in congregate care setting in group homes. So, so far, I'm going to just give you an approximation. As of November, about 600 people passed away in New York State. In, For, um, um, in uh, hold on, you mean in, in group homes, 600 people have passed away? Yeah, in, in, yeah, most of them in group homes, okay? I'm not going to, I, I can't give you a, um, a percentage, but most that's of them fine, in group homes. That's fine, that's fine, yeah. And, um, but New York has done a tremendous job in terms of COVID for people with disabilities. Mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. Our advocates were really on it, okay? And so right off the bat, each state has a tier of who gets priorities for the COVID vaccine. Yes, ma'am. So in New York State, medical staff were the, you know, the, the st online staff people were the first, category one, yep. one A. One B, people with disabilities were included, okay? So they, they had access. So we have about an 89% rate of vaccination for individuals in certified residential settings, that's apartments, group homes, people within OPWDD. We have 89% have gotten vaccinated. Our problem in New York State is that the DSPs, direct support staff, basically, are, don't have that high a vaccination rate. It's, it's been a problem. We're doing education. I just came off a conference on that. but. Um, about 40 to 44 percent have received vaccines in that staffing. Okay. Is it mandatory? It, uh, I'm sorry. Is it? Not, yeah. Is it mandatory it, in group homes for the um, residents to be um, um, vaccinated? No, there was a choice. There was a choice, but most residents wanted it. To tell you the truth, because they saw how sick people got. Okay. They mm -hmm. wanted the vaccine. Yes, ma'am. Um, but what's happening now, actually, there will be, um, I think there will be a CMS um, uh, ruling coming out. And so um, there will be a mandate for staff that are, are involved, mm -hmm. at least in, I think, in, in the United States mm -hmm. by December 5th. Um, not, they're going to have to start getting the vaccine. Mm -hmm. um, but, but getting back to this, what we do is we provide, um, we provide uh, educational webinars. Mm -hmm. um, and information on our social media site mm -hmm. for COVID-19. And so we work with our 
our provider organization, AUCD, the Association of University Centers for Disabilities. And um, there is material on that website. There's material on our VaxFacts, DDNY website. Mm -hmm. And then, as I said, we do these webinars. So we're reaching families, staff, mm -hmm. organizations, and our self-advocacy group will be doing a, an educational event for New York State self-advocates come December 10th. Mm -hmm. That group of self-advocates will be uh, giving a webinar along with a physician on COVID-19 and the vaccines. But as I say, many people are vaccinated, but they still have questions. They have questions now about the boosters. They have questions. They have many questions. So. Um, so a really quick, meeting. really quick before we end, what is the um, website that people can, uh, uh, you know, reach um, the Kennedy Center, the Albert Einstein College of Medicine? Uh, mm -hmm. Go ahead. Uh, go ahead on your programs. Go ahead. Okay. So um, the best way to do this is to go to www. Um, Einstein, E-I-N-S-T-E-I-N dot Y-U dot E-D-U and search for UCED, U-C-E-D-D, -D, and you can get this material. Okay. And, uh, well, we would like to thank um, the Rose F. Kennedy Center and Joanne Siegel for this informative um, program. Uh, special thanks to the, like I said, special thanks to the Rose F. Kennedy Center and um, the Einstein College of Medicine and Montefiore Medical Center for their work in helping people with developmental uh, disabilities and uh, developmental challenges. Um, we would like to say special uh, for Ableton on Air, um, <clears throat> special thanks to our sponsors, Green Mountain Support Services, Washington County Mental Health, and many others, including the partnerships of um, the Association for the Blind and Visually Impaired, the Division for the Blind and Visually Impaired of Vermont, Central Vermont uh, Habitat for Humanity, uh, the uh, Sustainable Montpelier Coalition, and many, many, many others. Thank you, Joanne, for joining us on this edition of Able Dead on Air. Uh, Arlene is not here today, um, but see you next time on the next edition of Able Dead on Air. I'm Lauren Seiler. In spite of the dramatic discoveries in medicine, the number of mentally retarded is increasing. Whooping cough, diphtheria, scarlet fever have all but been but eliminated. But every year, 126,000 children are born who are or who will become retarded. And parents frequently must face decisions in hospitals of what uh, therapy should be adopted to preserve a child's life, knowing that that therapy may bring about mental retardation or blindness. Almost 5,000 of these children are so severely retarded that they will never be able to care for their own needs. This tragic human waste, which of course affects uh, not only the child, but the family that is involved, can and must be stopped. And I think we have an obligation as a country, especially a country as rich as ours, especially a country which has so much money to spend on so many things, which may be desirable, but uh, maybe not essential in every case, we certainly should have the resources to uh, spend to make a major effort to see if we can uh, block this, stop it, and cure it. Ableton On Air is sponsored by Green Mountain Support Services, empowering people with disabilities to be home in the community. Washington County Mental Health, where hope and support comes together.
Media sponsors for Ableton On Air include Parkchester Times, Muslim Community Report, www.thisisthebronx.info, Associated Press Media Editors, New York Parrot Online Newspaper, U.S. Press Corps, Domestic and International, Anchor FM, and Spotify. Partners for Ableton On Air include Yachad, New York and New England, where everyone belongs, the Orthodox Union, the Vermont Division for the Blind and Visually Impaired, the Vermont Association for the Blind and Visually Impaired, the Montpelier Sustainable Coalition, Central Vermont Habitat for Humanity. Able Dinner on Air has been seen in the following publications, Park Tester Times, New York Parrot Online Newspaper, Muslim Community Report, www.thisisthebronx.info, and www.h.com. Able Dinner on Air is a member of the National Academy for Television Arts and Sciences, Boston, New England, Chapter.